Hello, welcome to the Study Abroad Virtual Fair. My name is Emma Wright. I'm the Study Abroad Advisor here at USU. Um, and this is the session for the Australia Coral Reefs Program. And this is the faculty leader, Ed Hamill, and he's going to be talking to you today. So go ahead, Ed. Hi, how are you going? Uh, Ed, is it Dana? Am I getting that right? It's Dana. Dana, sorry, yeah, I'm absolutely terrible at pronunciations. Yeah, congratulations, you're the first person in, so, <laughs> so well done. Um, so you have undivided attention for a few secs. Uh, okay. Before we started, have you have you heard anything about this class at all prior to this Oh, uh, I just saw it yesterday online and I thought it looked really interesting, so. <laughs> Sweet, okay. Have you seen, we produced a video, what, 2017, 2018? Have you seen that yet? I okay. I, what I'll do is in the chat, uh, give me a sec, in the chat, I'm gonna keep this up online and I can just zap it through to you every time. Okay. Basically, when we did the show, when we did the class a few years ago, we had a film crew with us because we were shooting a kid's documentary at the same time. And uh, they did us a massively overproduced, really nice quality video as well while we were out there which we were expecting to be okay, and it turned out to be a lot better. So give me a second. Uh, yes, yeah, so that talks, it talks a little bit about, it's basically a bit of an advert, but, uh, so do you want me to, I can tell you a wincy bit about the class and how it operates as well, if you want. So the way that we did, so Tricia and I, who's the other faculty member on this, we have worked on this station, like out in this one particular station in Australia since about 2013. And when we came to uh, Utah, they said, like, if you ever want to do a student field, if you want to do a field course out here, just let us know. And so we started putting that together. The first one went out in, was it 2016 or 2017? I can't remember. Oh, and here's Faith Johnson, who I know already as well. But so uh, we started going out there yeah, way back then, and we've now run the course. We were meant to take it for the fourth time this year, but unfortunately, oh, everyone's coming in, unfortunately got cancelled. And the course, its intention is anybody that wants to work in any sort of marine biology or any marine field, anything basically to do with the ocean, the progression that you normally do is you, when you're an undergrad, uh, at some point you do some volunteer work in a lab, and then after that you go into a graduate position. But it's so crazy competitive that even getting a volunteer position is actually difficult because it's a totally different environment for most students. For one, you're working in somewhere that you can't breathe in, which is very, very terrifying. Like if, when you just think about the sheer logistics of that. So our course, the idea is it gives people that first bit of experience of working in the ocean so that in the future, they can apply to these volunteer positions, they can apply for graduate programs and they can have a document saying, like documented proof, I've worked in the water, I know how to set a transit line, I know how to do quadrats, I know how you use video analyses to assess fish diversity, I know how you measure coral abundance, how you measure coral health, like they can actually demonstrate and uh, we write, I write an awful lot of reference letters for the students that come on this class. Um, I've written three this week <laughs> because it's grad school application time. And so uh, as a result, it just is it's really clear proof for students that they can actually do this kind of work. The class itself, like I really love it. It's a genuine highlight of the year. It's we only take a very small number of students. So we cap the class at 13 and there are two instructors, Trisha and I. So you get to know the instructors incredibly well. We work together for usually about eight hours a day. We take every meal together. We all have breakfast together. We have lunch together, dinner together. Um, the students sleep in the next dorm from us. And so I have been known to shout at them for making a couple bit too much noise now and again. Like we're literally right next to each other the whole time. And so you get to know the instructors incredibly well. Uh, we... The way the course works is you have four labs where they're highly um, highly structured. So we wake up in the morning, we talk through a little bit of theory, um, we then present a question or a hypothesis, and we t tell you in class how you actually test this hypothesis. We then usually between about sort of nine and 10 or nine and 11, 
we go into the water and we actually collect the data we need. We then come back, have lunch. We then uh, go into the lab, analyze the data, or sometimes we're back in the water again. We then have dinner. Uh, we then have like chill out, do what you want time. And then we usually go and all watch the sunset go down over the jetty because it's because it's just really nice. Um, there, in addition to the formal lab like structure of the class, every day there are two optional swims. So we do the dawn patrol. So you get up in the morning, we, I meet you at usually about 20 past six in the morning, everybody in a wetsuit and all ready to go. And we go down to the dock and we swim in the big boat dock because the, in the, there's not an awful lot of coral in there, but at night there's this huge dock where the boats come in and all of the big things collect in this dock overnight because it's a nice, comfortable, nice place to hang out. So if you get up really in the morning and you get up and you are out in the water when the sun comes up, you basically, that's when you get to swim with a load of the turtles, the sharks, and a lot of the big stingrays and all those sorts of things. And we go out that, we go out in the morning and do that. We do another one of those in the afternoon. So you go out and do a sunset version of it as well. Those are totally optional. Um, there's every single year, there's at least one student that comes on every single one, and they're the students that get to see everything. And what often happens is the first day, everybody comes on those optional swims. They make a lot of noise because everyone's kind of new in the water. There's a lot of splashing around and people see a few things, but not so much. And then over the next few days, it tends to be the abundance tapers off because people want a bit of a lion and then on, then it gets down to like there'll be two or three students, then something amazing happens and the next day everybody comes back. <laughs> so they're the best way to actually go out and see things. And then in addition to the labs, like the labs where we tell you what to do, we also have um, what we call outer reef trips. So if you've ever seen Finding Nemo, where Nemo's family live at the beginning, and the barracuda eats his entire family, basically. We do two trips out to that spot, and we basically go out on a boat, anchor up to a, attached to a line. All the students jump in the water with usually Trisha at the front and me at the back, and all the students in a line. And then we drift down the outer reef, and the boat comes around and picks us up at the other end. And that is where you get to see these just insane coal scapes. It's just, it's, it's crazy. It's really good fun. And the final part of the class, the last four, sort of four to five days, um, is when the students self-organize into groups and they actually set up their own little experiments and they conduct their own research project under the supervision of Tricia and I and collect their own data. And what we do is, before you're allowed out to go in the water for that project, Trish and I work with you to make sure that what you're planning on doing is possible, safe and legal. So we have to be very careful because it is where we are is the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Green Zone. It's the second highest level of protection of any marine place in the world. And so we have to be incredibly careful that everything we're doing is above board and we have permits for and things like that. And what we do is you guys come up with a question. Trisha and I then work with you to think about, okay, how would we answer that question using the techniques that we've discovered that we've learned so far. Then the students usually go out for two days and go and collect the data on their own with Trisha and I, um, Trisha and I there as well, make sure everything's above board and safe. And then the students write up their project. They do a presentation, like a PowerPoint presentation. And on the last day, we have like a miniature symposium where all the students talk about their projects. That has been uh, really good fun. A lot of students are apprehensive sometimes about trying to come up with their own projects. Some of the projects we've had have been absolutely amazing. We've had um, students look at uh, whether healthy coral is better for um, fish diversity than uh, less healthy coral and whether or not that differs by coral type. Uh, we had one student look at how plastic enters the ocean by taking cores all around the island at different levels on the strand line and basically showing there's a point where we eat, uh, where we, uh, plastic enters. Uh, we had some students go and look at why do stingrays all collect in a big cuddle puddles, which was really good fun. Like if you get up in the morning and go down to the dock, there's massive piles of stingrays. They're usually about three foot cross and they all lie in these big 
what we call cuddle puddles. They all sort of lie on top of each other. And there's people asking, like, why on earth do they do that? And so is there certain, is it they go on the sheltered side of the island or they go further out and everything in between. So, yeah, it's kind of good fun. Uh, that's me just harping on. Does anybody have any questions at all before we go any further? There's a question in the chat, Ed, about yeah. um, are we all eating the same thing? We've got yeah. a student who's plant-based and was wondering if there's flexibility, if there's an issue with that. Oh, uh, it's absolutely fine. The case, we actually hire a very, very nice catering company. Um, we decided to do this after we've working on the island, you can either hire a caterer or you can do it yourself. And it just took far too much time to ourselves. So we just hired a nice caterer. The group that we bring in are absolutely fantastic. They cater to every possible dietary need. All you do is you tell me well in advance before we go what dietary issues you, uh, or dietary concerns you have, and they will sort out everything. That's everything from, we've had uh, a hardcore vegan the first year who absolutely loved it because mm -hmm. Um, Pat, who was the chef, used to make her an individual dessert every single day because she was the only person that couldn't have milk or cream. She was just amazed because she said, I've not eaten dessert in years because nobody ever does anything. Uh, we've had students with every allergy. We've had a low sulfur diet. That was an interesting one that we've, I've never heard of before. So we have no issues. The dietary stuff is fine. We do all eat at the same time, um, but the actual, there's, set aside of vegetarians and things like that it's totally fine the students always rave about the food every single time in the student blog everybody talks yeah. about the food so so um has anybody heard about i'm going to put in the chat room i've already put the um i've put the video but i'm also going to find the blog give me just a second so what uh, i actually have what? it right here if you want me to drop can you it. just yeah copy the link into that so just for the students that are on one of the things that we do every year is we set up uh, a blog where every day we set aside 20 minutes to half an hour of time and every student has their own blog page. And what you do is you get 20 minutes set aside just to talk, write about your experiences that day. And uh, the idea being that for future students, this is a really good window into the student life while you're there because it's being written by somebody who was on the island at the time. For the students themselves, it becomes a great source of memories because they've got these pictures all in one place, they have the videos all in one place, they're able to maintain contact with the other folks. Um, Trisha and I do not do any editing at all on that blog. So as a result, it, can, it has got a little bit sweary a couple of times <laughs> because people do get a bit overly Australian. But as a result, we say, you can just like write whatever, what, what scared you that day, what amazed you things that didn't go so great like everything so for any student that's interested then please go through that blog and you can almost see who what sort of per because you get a great sort of window into the personality of these people and you can see how you would align with it okay uh who do you reach out oh yeah so nikki's asking about who do you actually have questions after the session yeah uh nikki just email me absolutely anytime uh have you got my email address easily? I'm just going to write it in here just in case you need. Yeah, it's listed in the brochure, and I've dropped the link to the brochure, and that's also where okay. you can apply for the program. Yeah. Yeah, okay. perfect. Um, uh, yes, there are no, uh, Dana, there are no prerequisites at all. We assume that nobody has done anything like this at all. Uh, before, the only prerequisite, the only thing you have to do beforehand is pass the swim test, which is super, super easy. That swim test is not, are you a Olympic swimmer? It is just, are you going to sink like a rock when you jump in the water? So it's just an ability to say, okay, you've got to do 200 meters in the pool in less than eight, in I think less than eight minutes, which is super easy. It's just to make sure you're not going to jump off a boat and sink, basically. Um, yeah, we don't assume any, we don't assume any prior knowledge at all. Uh, the class is heavily skills based rather than knowledge based. So most of your assessment is based on the labs. You do early on, we do an ID test. So you learn a whole bunch of the names, the different fish and invertebrates and turtles and all those sorts of things. We do that early on just so that it makes everything else much easier if the students can identify the species and also the students just get an awful lot more out of it, which is kind of cool. 
Um, it's open to all majors. If you are a science or a Queenie College of Natural Resources major, this class counts as one of your electives. If you are in any other uh, major, this counts as your life sciences uh, depth class. So everybody has to do a breadth class and a depth class for life sciences. This counts as that. It means you don't have to do like Trisha's introduction to ecology or kind of what other classes are capable for as well. It ticks off that life sciences depth very, very nicely indeed. So. There's a question about prerequisites. You kind of touched on it. Yeah, yeah, just in that, yeah. Yeah, and so it's, yeah, I mean, we absolutely love it. We've had a great time. It's, I think you guys at study abroad have rent it like the number one student experience at USU for like the last four years or something. So, I mean, it's pretty hard to get it wrong when you're going out of this tiny island. So, the, I mean, the island itself is, you can see this sh uh, aerial footage of it in the video. It is just absolute paradise. It's right on the southern tip of the Great Barrier Reef. Because it's Southern Hemisphere, it's Australia, all the temperature gradients are inverted. So south is cold in Australia and north is hot, as opposed to here. So being on the southern tip of the Great Barrier Reef means that it's right at the very cooler bit at the bottom. What that means is it hasn't had the same, uh, in, hasn't had the same problems with coal bleaching as a large part of the north, northern sector has. So as with the coal is still remarkably healthy. The island itself has not allowed any fishing, I don't think, since about the 1960s. So it is uh, that wildlife there is hyper abundant and it's also massive. That's the one thing a lot of people are quite surprised about. So especially anyone that's been snorkeling in Hawaii or something like that, you see these parrotfish about this sort of size. In Heron Island, some of those same species are about six foot long. They get absolutely massive and they live anything to 40, 50 years. There's a turtle that lives in the bay who's been there for at least 80 or 90 years, who's an absolute giant as well. And it's just because there's no hunting. There's nothing like that. Oh, I'm just checking some of the questions. So uh, Nikki's asking, if we're not majoring specifically in fisheries, uh, what will let, uh, will that lessen chances of potential career in marine life? Not necessarily, no. Um, my undergraduate degree is in zoology. Uh, basically, if you're looking at getting eventually into marine sciences, the big things you need are some sort of experience and a track record, and then to have done well. Uh, in a lot of cases, a lot of the concepts, especially if you're doing things in ecology or biogeochemistry and things like that, the concepts are transferable between systems. Um, I only start, I've only done about three or four marine projects, so I've led them myself. The most of my stuff is on conservation planning, some freshwater stuff, some terrestrial, and it's just whatever's, whatever's uh, what works best. Um, and Steph's asking, do a lot of people apply and what are our chances of getting picked? So, first up, in, we don't know about this year. Uh, previous years, we've had between 50% and 100% more people apply than we can take. And so what we do is we do um, multiple levels of filtering. The biggest one is uh, get people that I've spoken to, people I've interacted with. Um, I find it an awful lot easier to select those folks. If you have never interacted with me before, that's fine. Please email me. We can set up a chance to talk on Zoom or something like that. Because what we pick on is a lot of it is actually do we really get on with these people? Because we're trapped on a tiny island for two weeks. And if you're there with somebody who kind of rubs you up the wrong way, it is brutal. We then also talk about in the application, you have to write a personal statement. In that personal statement, go into detail, talk about what you want to do in life and talk about how this class will help you with that. Talk about, feel free to talk about, you know, hopes and dreams and all sorts of stuff. And that's, that's totally fine and try and relate it to how this class will help because the folks that we really want are folks that are easy to get on with, super enthusiastic and keen. And I've already sort of got an idea in their mind about, okay, I want to, not necessarily exactly what I want to do, but I can see the opportunities this presents me and I can see the fact this gets me a bit closer to where I do want to go to. Um, but as I, And then also one of the things you have to do is references on the, I think you have to you have to put in one reference or two now, Emma. 
I think it's just one. Just the one, okay. It, um, for those references, they don't necessarily have to be a professor or another academic. We just need somebody that um, you've worked with maybe, or you've worked closely with and can, can talk about your abilities and gender you very well. If you don't have that, again, please contact me and we will organize a Zoom interview or something like that. And that is actually how I prefer doing the references. And then all, and you've seen a lot of the applications in previous years, Emma, where somebody's reference is just like me saying, I've met this person, yes, and that's it. Because it's, I'm not gonna write a reference for myself. I'm just gonna say like, I've met this person and they're great. So yeah, if you're- abroad does prefer at least one academic reference. Mm -hmm. um, so that is our requirement, but definitely yeah. you can have as many references as you want. Yeah, right yeah. One, but um, mm -hmm. just pick good ones, not somebody who's going to be like, nah, I don't like this student. Don't pick those. Yeah. Um, someone else has put in. So Nikki sending, this is a somewhat silly question. No such thing. Since Utah is inland, if we successfully get into this course, is it possible to start an undergraduate research project to marine life? Yes. So we've had about three or four students that have actually done projects with us based around this course and other things. So in the first year, one of the students got an undergraduate research grant. And while we were at Heron, she actually conducted her own project looking at um, grazing by herbivorous fish at different distances from these patch reefs out in the lagoon, which was, it was great that she got it. We didn't realize, I think, maybe how much extra work it was going to put on, not only for her, but because on the island, the big golden rule is you must never go in the water on your own, ever, under any circumstances. So it meant that somebody always had to go out with her. And at times we were hauling anything up to 200 pounds worth of equipment about 400 feet out into the ocean, which means people swimming with tubs and pushing things around. So it was great and the results were awesome, but holy cow, it was a lot of work. So, <laughs> but yeah, we have had, and then other students, um, of the students I've had working in my lab, I would say about 60% of them are students that have been on this class because when they when people are then asking for work i've i've been in close contact with a person i know them well i know we can work together so i often take them on well let's have a look do people have worked with in the academics in the wildlife society here at usu cat as an academic reference if you've worked closely with them and you've done stuff that would work yeah absolutely so that's a great idea <clears throat> yeah um I'm telling you anything else we need to talk about. Uh, yes, yeah, so we do. So the way the course actually, after we've selected our people, the big thing we want to do is get everybody to know each other as quickly as possible. And there's multiple reasons for that is, one, it's often easiest if when the people who are on the course are traveling out to the island, it's much better if you're traveling in a little group. So if you know each other, you know at least a few people, you can go out and then we meet up with you on the other side. Also, a lot of people like to travel either before or after the class. We like to suggest traveling before the class because it means that one, you're actually in Australia. So that's great because there's a limit to how far away you can actually get. And, and a lot of students, and also Australia is incredibly safe. It's one of the safest countries in the world to go traveling in. Um, when Trisha and I lived in Australia, we had to fill out special forms to go to work in the US because the US is considered a dangerous nation, according to Australia. They think it's, they think it's uh, over there is crazy safe. It's also Australia is incredibly good for traveling for people in that sort of 18 to 30 age group. The entire nation is basically set up for it. There's backpackers hostels everywhere. We've had students all club together and rent out camper vans and just go on these crazy jaunts through large parts of the place. We had students disappearing up into the far north Queensland and getting into cane toad racing and looking at crocodiles. It was, it's been great fun. And it's also, uh, was it last year? The, I think it was, no, it was the year before where the usual route to get to the island is you fly from Salt Lake to Los Angeles, then Los Angeles to Sydney. And we recommend people hang out in Sydney for a few days just to see Sydney is an astonishing city. It is, again, incredibly safe, very, very beautiful. It's full of iconic landmarks. And um, we know an incredible youth hostel that's literally right next to the Sydney Opera House. 
And one year we got together with a bunch of students and they literally booked out a huge section of that hostel and they all hung out there for a week before and they loved it. And it's, it's really good. Let's look at this one. So would we be allowed to stay in Australia for a bit after the course ends? Oh, so you travel to Australia on your own or in groups. Um, students schedule their own flights. Trisha and I will help you schedule your flights. So we basically, uh, we meet at a tiny little podunk airport um, in a place, a town called Gladstone. And we stay overnight in a youth hostel in Gladstone that Trisha and I have known for years. And then we, the next day we all get up, we get on the Heron Islander ferry and we get the boat over to the island. Um, so what we say is the best way for us to meet you is there's one plane that goes from Brisbane to Gladstone that Trisha and I will be on. If you can get yourself on that flight, it means we actually meet you on the plane, which is really nice. Prior to that, you can do whatever you like. And after that, you can do whatever you like. Um, if you do want, uh, I know for a lot of people booking these flights, it's quite a nervous process. Sometimes, some people, it's the first time they've done this. We've had a lot of people who've never left the country before come on this trip. We've had a few people who've never been on a plane before come on this trip. So um, if you are in any way nervous, what you can do is identify your flights that you think you might want to take, send the itinerary to Trisha and I, we will have a look at it and just say, okay, this makes sense. Or, okay, let's think about doing it a slightly different way. Uh, and then you can go ahead and book it. And it just means, takes a bit of the pressure off. It's also why we try and get everybody to know each other a bit before the class so that students get the opportunity to tr take a flight together. Um, generally traveling, especially air travel in Australia is super, super easy. Um, especially flying into either the big cities like Sydney or Brisbane. Uh, they get an awful lot of travelers from all over the world, an awful lot of people that can't speak English coming in at age 18, 19, 20, they haven't really traveled before. And their airports are just set up wonderfully to help lost international waifs and strays get to the right place. And so they're pretty good at it. We've never had an issue um, with people on the traveling. It's been universally fine. And Ed, um, you guys have experience with the visa requirements and stuff, yeah. right? Yes, the visa requirements are super easy. You do have to get a visa to go to Australia, um, but it's what you have to do is get your passport. So if you haven't got a passport, you need to get that applied for as quickly as possible. Um, Australia's visa system is light years ahead of most other countries in the world. All you have to do to get your visa is you get your passport, you go online and we can send you the link to get your, I think it's called an ETA visa. It costs you $20 and that allows you unlimited entry into Australia for a year and staying a maximum of three months any one time. And all you have to do is fill out some details online, pay $20, and then you get an email saying you have been granted a visa. It is tied to, it is tied to your passport electronically. So you don't get any paper, you don't get none of that. You literally turn up on the day they scan your passport and be like, yep, you're good. And so it's much, much better than it is in a lot of other systems. I was pretty astonished how easy it was, to be honest. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's it's generally, it's a really, really easy place to get around in and very good. If you want, the one thing we do say though is if you're thinking of renting a van or a car or anything like that, they do drive on the other side of the road. So that's a bit of a, a bit of a surprise to some folks every now and again. But Generally, it's it's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. Well, just as a few last points, um, what you if you think the things that you're going to be uh, interacting with and seeing how the big things that I like to do is ally anyone's fears. Australia seems to have this reputation that the entire outside is full of things that bite and sting and hurt and in a thousand horrible ways. Heron is really, really safe. We're too far south for saltwater crocodiles, so we don't get any of those. We're too far north for great white sharks, so we don't get any of those. And we're too far off the um, coast of Australia for the nasty jellyfish, so we don't get any of those. You do see a lot of jellyfish, but nothing that's going to, you can actually play with them. They don't really sting. You can, they're quite fun. Um, we've got a video from a few years ago of me and one of the students. There was a massive jellyfish 
um, a load of them got collected into the into the dock and we got up really in the morning and went and swam in this massive jellyfish bloom because the turtles come in and eat the jellyfish so if you just sit there being really really still you'll have turtles like eating the jellyfish around you which is which is really cool so and it, it was like in the video you can see at one point i got so excited i just span around in the spot <laughs> it was just like yeah but yeah it's great fun um so the for the diversity of sharks we do get a lot of sharks at the island an awful lot um the main things that we see are black tip reef white tip reef they both get to about a maximum size about seven or eight feet they are not considered aggressive in any way shape or form if there's they sometimes come and investigate you which can be a little bit unnerving but it's totally fine we do also get nurse sharks which get up to about nine foot uh they are on the list they're on the bit of the naughty list but we've never had any issues and they're actually uh, really really nice to hang around with we have seen one tiger shark which was an everybody out the water job but it's generally and you can read if you read the student blog it's that's a great incident when that happened um but you do see a lot of them but you should not be apprehensive about them in any way the, every year we've been some of the students that just really want to get in the water with the sharks and really want to hang around with them that's totally fine uh we no one has ever been there that's wanted to swim with a shark and hasn't got the opportunity and a lot of the time some of them do get people have some really really close time with them it's good fun the big thing to learn is sharks generally don't like being chased so if you see them the best thing to do is if the calmer you are and the quieter they'll actually often come up and have a look at you which is quite cool um some of the other my favorite like my own personal favorite stuff to swim with it's actually i like the sharks i really like the turtles the turtles are just hilarious but especially when in the outer reef you get these massive gigantic schools of fusiliers and they are these beautiful fish about this sort of size you get schools of in the tens of thousands of them and if you're gentle and quiet and things like that then you can actually get into the middle of the school and the fish will cling to you because you become a refuge so you end up with this huge load of fish around you which is really really kind of fun oh what's next then? uh are there certain endangered species in out of the water we need to be aware of uh, to not touch or get too close to the only rule is don't touch the turtles generally we say don't touch anything um as part of the class you will be touching things because we've got to lay transect lines and things like that but generally they don't touch anything the turtles the temptation to touch them is super super high because some of the times they will get really close the rule with the turtles is you can't touch them they can touch you and if they do you're not expected to flail around and get out of the way but just some of them especially the gigantic loggerhead that lives in the dock he's been there for about 80 years he's totally done with people he's just had enough of people entirely so he will just swim through the middle of large groups of people he knows they're not going to hurt him he just wants them out of the way because he's got somewhere to go and he has actually swam straight into one of the students before and he weighs about 250 pounds so it was a it was a bit of a surprise and his head's about the size of a basketball so it's quite big you know, head on him so and he's just he's just he's been in this place it's got loads of people all the time and he's just like get out of the way so it's yeah it's good fun uh for some of the other really cool species we get there we do get spotted eagle ray sometimes you'll see be out in the morning and see big spotted eagle ray um last year we saw a manta ray as well which is a really big deal it was about um 15 feet across the wings so an awful lot bigger than anything else in the water um that they're a real crazy thing to see like they're just they're kind of rare and also they're just pretty special um the big thing uh, to think about is we do have while we're out there we have formal class time and then we have time we have a bit of recreational time we also have time every day to set aside for these sort of recreational swims stuff like that during the class time a lot of the time the goal is get in and get things done just as quickly as you can because um that's when people are especially first learning the techniques like laying down transit lines setting quadrats stuff like that it can be a little bit chaotic and we tend to get people here there everywhere um so we tend to say people like okay let's focus on our work make sure we get this done make sure we get the data done and then we separate time for actually swimming and looking at things and going having fun and learning about stuff um 
that does tend to work out pretty well. Somebody said they'd um, already done stuff with the Wildlife Society. Some of those folks that we've had to come to the Wildlife Society are great fun because they'll often have done work in the, um, they'll have done work on, on land. And so they think they know about, okay, here's how you set a line and all that sort of stuff. It's totally different in the water. And so, first of all, if you're setting a transit line, the land doesn't have a current that's continuously moving you. So you can actually walk in a reasonably straight line. You can't do that in the water. Oh, I'm just asking this questions coming in. Okay. Yeah, so also, uh, Emma, just to make a note, that cost, that includes tuition and fees, doesn't it? Because... Mm -hmm. Yeah, that includes yeah, the program fee. Yeah, there's, there's the whole thing because this class is you. What is it? The standard tuition is fifteen hundred dollars or something like that for a class. Somewhere it's around like eleven hundred for three credits. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and so you don't pay student body fees. So you just pay the program fee. You just pay the program fees. So the actual cost on top of a regular class is only about nineteen hundred dollars. I remember. Yeah. So the total that's the total class so that includes all your accommodation when you're there, all your meals when you're there, and absolutely everything on island. You don't need to have any money with you at all on island. The only thing you can spend money on, even if you want to, is slightly tacky souvenirs, like this shirt, <laughs> things like that. But you don't need anything else. Someone asked me about, will it be scoo su uh, OK, so we do the whole course on free dive, just because there's a couple of reasons. One. It means that nobody has to be scuba certified in advance. Second, uh, on free dive, you can be in the water an awful lot longer than you can on scuba. So if you're doing scuba just on regular air, you're kind of limited to about an hour in the water on each set. We sometimes are doing four hours in the water. So as a result, you just can't do that on a scuba unless you're going into hardcore. Um, if you are scuba certified uh, and you want to actually dive on the island, that is possible. We play... We set aside uh, one day, sometimes two days in the morning, depending on how quickly we get through work, where we can negotiate with the resorts on island to take people out on actual scuba trips. If you are not scuba certified and you want to do something like that, they will actually do a discovery scuba dive with you, which you do pay extra for this, but they are hilarious. It's basically you go out with a one-to-one -one instructor and they almost ride you like a horse and sort of move you around just and make sure your buoyancy is right and stuff like that. Um, Trish and I also usually go on those scuba dives as well because it's fun. <laughs> so, so if you ask scuba, um, yeah. So also the thing with the difference with scuba and free dive is the water there is super clear and a lot of time it's not all that deep so the maximum amount of water we're in the whole time is maybe 12 meters um so on a scuba dive you don't actually get to see anything necessarily that you can't see on a free dive because everything's around you the only difference is on a scuba you get to stay down the whole time and interact with it a bit more whereas on a uh free dive you often just if your snorkeling's going on the surface they take an occasional dips up and down um, our range of abilities that we've taken out there with regard to the water, we've had a lot of people who've never put on a mask and snorkel before, before the class. Um, we've had some folk who are unbelievably good in the water. We've had a fair few folks from, we've had a fair few student athletes and you can tell straight away just the level of physicality is kind of, kind of crazy. Um, and then we've had some folks that start off very uncomfortable in the water indeed and then over but their level of progression during the course of the two weeks is unbelievable they go from being super nervous crazy scared panicking when a little wave goes over their snorkel to chasing around and having a great time so it's just experience yeah it's good fun well we're just about out of time so are there any last questions for ed First off, it's really nice to meet you all. So, so those, uh, I've met, I've met one of you uh, quite before. But if you are interested, the big thing to do is send me just an email with your name, your major, and obviously your email address. And I'm going to put what I'll do is I'll put that on a, on the list, and then 
we just continuously send out information in the going couple of uh, rest of the semester, and then we'll to actually catch up with people. That makes sense. Well, thank you guys so much for tuning in. No worries. Great to yeah. have you on. Yeah. yeah, reach out if you have more questions. And make sure to look at uh, that video that's in the group chat and also the student blog. I love the student blog. It is just some of the some of the things that turn up on there. Also, for those that were talking about the food, the amount of time, like we take all these students all the way to the Great Barrier Reef on this tiny little island and they have a great time. And the amount of time they spend just talking about the food, it's just it's like, should we just hire you a nice cook or something like that? <laughs> so it's a good one. Right. No worries, I'll stop prattling on. All right, thank you guys. Have a good afternoon. Thank Too you. easy. Cheers.